When you hear the word romantic, what do you think? Dara, what do you think when you hear the word romantic? Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Totality. Romantic. What do you think about romantic? Isn't it romantic? He's such a romantic. What does that mean? Bridget. Lovey dovey. What's romantic? Bridget. Was that loving? Give me something, God girls. If you uh, think of a boyfriend that might have done something romantic for you, or guys, a girl that did something romantic for you, or a friend that did something romantic, give me, give me, a, give me an example, hypothetical example. No one can come up. Audrey, flowers. flowers. One of those like kayak rides. A kayak ride out to the lake, and then he recites a sonnet he wrote on your behalf, yeah. comparing you to the moon. All right, that's romantic. Okay, guys, can I have your attention? All right, going to Taco Bell, putting a tablecloth over a table, taking out LED lights, little candles, taking out some china from your mom's china cabinet, getting some cutlery, your mom's nice cutlery, and then putting the burrito on the china, you know, and then a nice romantic candlelit dinner for seven bucks. Taking the coke and pouring them into goblets. Why is that a great idea? You take this idea. It's worked for me. It's worked for me. All right, guys. A brief definition. Guys, make sure this. you write this down. It was an artistic and intellectual movement originating in Europe in the late 18th century. Late, like 1700s. As the age of reason was leaving, we had the age of romanticism. And it was characterized by a heightened interest in nature, as we see in this picture from the uh, from the from uh, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So we have nature. We have emphasis on the individual, like in this picture, All right? Man above the snows, I think it's called. And the expression of emotion and imagination. If we're familiar with Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein creates a human being from dead tissue. He's acting like God, right? Using his imagination to create life. It was also a departure from the attitude and forms of classicism, which I'll show you later in this presentation. And it was a rebellion against established social rules and conventions. All right, so lots of different tenets, lots of different beliefs in the age of romanticism. It was a movement. It wasn't just in literature. It was in art. It was in music. It was in the difference between Mozart and Beethoven, between classical architecture and romantic architecture, which I'll show you. So this was a movement, a movement. And writers at this time were caught up in the zeitgeist. A zeitgeist is the spirit of the times. Write that down, zeitgeist. It comes from the German with a capital Z. How do you spell that? Wait, that's not right. I got it. Wait. Z E I T G E I S T. The zeitgeist. It's called the spirit of the times. The spirit of the times. That's a really good word to throw around sometimes, too, especially on like an SAT exam. The zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, right? Now, we talk about rebellion, social rules and conventions. Um, many of you perhaps know or know of someone. Can we think of someone who was a bit of a rebel? A bit of a rebel. Who's a re anyone? Rebel? Chueda? Rebel? You're a rebel? You go against you go against the man? Alright. The dates of romanticism, it goes from late 18th century to early 19th century, beginning in 1789 with the French Revolution. It ended in 1830 in Europe with the death of Sir Walter Scott. That's this guy here. He wrote the Waverly novels, he wrote the very famous book, uh, the novel Ivanhoe. Alright, so if you were really into medieval romances and Lancelot and Guinevere. Uh, this was the guy you read, right? The South, the American South, some critics have said largely based their culture on the novels of Sir Walter Scott. Right. In America, write this down, 
the the American Romantic Movement ended in 1861. Why is that date significant? What happened in 1861 that would end Romanticism in America? Yes. Started the, Started the Civil War. Okay. With the bombing of what fort? Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter in what uh, harbor? Charleston Harbor. Okay. Guys, these are the different tenets. All right, tenets means beliefs, cornerstones, uh, pillars of romanticism. All right. This is seven general concepts. All right. Cons uh, romantics are concerned with matters of the soul and the heart and the innate goodness of humans. We have studied with the crucible and sinners in the hands of an angry God that man was born a sinner with original sin, as we know from young Goodman Brown. Romantics believe that human beings are born good. Jordan? You are born good. Tammy? Born pure. And what corrupts you? Society corrupts you. You are not born being a racist. You are not born being a sexist, all right? Kids, really early age, they play with each other. It doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, what orientation you are. But over time, civil society, family, uncles, friends will turn you or may turn you into a racist or turn you into a sexist or turn you into a killer, right? But you're not born a killer according to a romantic. It's society that corrupts you, right? But they believe in matters of the soul and the heart. All right, tenet number one. Romantics believe in the creative imagination. Einstein here very famously says imagination is more important than knowledge. Having facts, that's great. But what do you do with those facts? It's using the imagination to be able to think about all the different ways you can use things and and imagine, right? Um, which is very very important. Having an active imagination. Who here has it has a very active imagination? Amanda, I know you have a very active imagination. <laughs> you're listening in class. You're trying to listen to me, right? You're a little bored, but you fly off and now you're in Switzerland and you're hiking up the Matterhorn. Right? Or you're in a French cafe talking to some guy named Pierre. Right? Or you're in Spain talking to some very good looking guy named Juan. Right? I don't know. It's at, or you're just thinking about going home, open up a Diet Coke, laying on your couch, and your dog Snooky comes over, and you pet Snooky, and it's just imagination. You're using imagination. All right? Maybe, I uh, hope you don't have a dog named Snooky. <laughs> All right, tenant number two, love of travel and exotic locations. All right, here we have the you know, Dracula's castle of Transylvania. All right, romantics love writing about foreign locations, mysterious lands. Because most people reading this have never been to Casablanca, have never been to Transylvania, have never been to the jungles of Borneo, but through the miracle of reading, you can transport yourself into these places. Right? So we go with Lord Byron into the Middle East, in through Northern Africa, in through Albania and Italy, and we experience the world vicariously through reading. Right? And we get transported there. How many of you would love to be able to take on a backpack, jump on a train, and be in Istanbul by the morning? Anthony, Bridget, Sueda, love that, right? Just get on your backpack and travel. Right? You get into a little village in Italy, you don't know Italian, but you're hungry, and you're trying to negotiate dinner with the little woman behind the counter, and you want this, and she doesn't know English, you don't know Italian, but there's a great exchange there. Why would that experience be so amazing? I've, I've had that experience. It's pretty amazing. What's what's great about that experience? Yeah, Stephen. It's so different from like. It's so different, right? You have to use other ways of communication rather than speaking. Smile, pointing, 
You know, you're breaking down barriers. You're eating things you've never eaten before. In Spain, I was having squid in its own ink. A bowl came out of pitch black. It was pitch black. It was ink with, with, with a huge chunks of ink, of ink, of huge chunks of squid. It was, I would never have it again. <laughs> the squid, though, was good. And I used the bread, oh, the bread was so good, to mop up some of the ink. And I've never had that before. And it was it was an experience. It was an experience, all right? Being in Spain and then looking at things and experiencing things I've never experienced before, uh, good stuff, all right? But romantics like writing about travel and exotic locations. Second tenet, romantics stress feelings rather than facts. Here we have Captain, who is this guy? Does anyone know who this is? Captain Kirk, Captain Kirk Star Trek. This class knew Star Trek more than another class did. All right, this is Evil Kirk. This is Evil Kirk, all right? This is a great episode where there's two Kirks. There's the good Kirk and the bad Kirk, and it's the duality of man. It's it's the good side and the, and the evil side that we have wrestling for control of us, right? Jordan, do you sometimes feel that way? You have the evil Jordan, then the good Jordan, and they're fighting, right? They're fighting. Bridget, is there an evil Bridget and a good Bridget? No? It's just all good Bridget. Just all good. All right, so romantic stress feelings rather than facts, right? Feelings. What are feelings, guys? I mean, it's really a really stupid question. What are feelings? Emotions, right? If someone says, listen, why are you so upset? He was a jerk, and you know logically he's a jerk. This guy who broke up with you over a text message, or this guy who forgot your birthday, or just gave you an iron for your, for your birthday so you can iron his shirts. Right? You know, yeah, uh, is that awful? Here's an iron for you for your birthday. Here are my shirts. I, I love iron. All right, guys, can I have your attention? Logically, you know it's, it's, the best, it's, it's the best decision. But your feelings, your emotions are still tied to the person. So romantics reveal on emotion. So human beings do things that are not logical. It doesn't make any sense but we do things and feel things anyway, right? Feelings aren't facts, but you're still, you're still, you still have your feelings and they're still valid, they're still important. If someone says, oh, you'll just, you know, just snap out of it, snap out of it. Well, easy for you to say, right? These are my feelings, but romantics are all about the emotions and feelings, as we, as we know from Scott Letter. All right, here are some feelings, all right? This is a feeling of what? Happiness, which in two days when you guys are on break. Yay! Whoa! Party time. Here, all right, this is a feeling of sadness. And here we have all different types of feelings. What was that Disney movie that was out? Not Disney, Pixar. Inside Out. Lots of feelings. Great, 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 great. We go to the ski resort. We go to these different places. We take our kayak out on uh, Surbridge Lakes. We take it to Basto, we take, we go into nature to escape society. So it's in the woods that we seek God, that we find our true place in the world. Like a bear, we've, we've created societies that are false, that betray our true connection with the earth. And if you watch enough Disney movies like Pocahontas, you realize that Pocahontas is connected with the earth. If you watch that movie, Avatar, the, 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 the aliens or the, the, the creatures or the Native Americans are tied to the earth. It's, it's the people that divorce themselves from the earth and nature who are machines now, who come in to try to destroy what is peaceful and symbiotic about nature. The Native American living on the plains, moving with the buffalo, killing the buffalo, using its hide as warmth and as food, but then the military men come and kill everything, destroy everything, and just create houses when we're divorced from society and from nature. Right? So romantics see the power of landscape and nature as rejuvenative. Right? Number five, we see this in the Scarlet Letter all the time, supernatural and the metaphysical that which exists beyond the physical. It's beyond, beyond what we can see, hear, and touch. 
right? So Edgar Allan Poe, which we really haven't covered too much so far, uh, he was all about supernatural in the age of Romanticism. 30 years, no, when was, he was before Hawthorne, 15 years or so. He was dead by 1850, um, but he was an early pioneer of Romanticism. He did not like the New England writers, which we'll talk about, he hated them. Uh, but the emphasis on the supernatural. So when the A seems to glow, all right, when things happen in the woods, like the sun beating down on the A as God making sure that Hester realizes this is the sin, that's the supernatural happening. Right? This kind of supernatural stuff cannot happen logically. If you said, Mr. Bown, I'm writing a story about a vampire. Oh, it's a romantic story. No, it's a, it's, it's a classic story. No, it can't be classical because vampires do not exist. I'm sorry, they do not exist. I want to write about zombies. They do not exist. I want to write about witches. They do not exist, all right? It just doesn't make any sense. I want to write about a ghost that visits me. No, there are no ghosts. There are no ghosts. Prove to me there's a ghost. I can't miss it. Then it's not logical. It's not logical. So writing about that kind of stuff makes you, in a way, a romantic. So like Homer's epics then are considered romantic? Homer? Yeah. Uh, Homer exists before all of that. So, okay. That's another discussion. Yeah, Homer, that's, that's... Way before. Yeah, we can talk about that. There's probably elements of romanticism and stuff in there. And we could go back to the ancient literature uh, to see where the romantics and the classics got their origins from. That's a very good question. But you can see, you know, there's definitely elements of romanticism in Ulysses, in Odysseus and, you know, the Iliad, things like that. And we can think of enough contemporary examples of the supernatural, Twilight, Harry Potter, all of this kind of stuff plays into the romantic themes in our culture. All right, my, my personal hero right there. Tenant number six, nonconformity, the renegade. This is especially true in American culture where we just, we love the nonconformist and the renegade. Right, Han Solo, 1977, with his phaser, right? Shoot first, ask questions later, right? Always blasting his way to the truth, right? Why do you think we love the nonconformist and the renegade in our society? Hester is the nonconformist and the renegade. Why do we like the renegade and the nonconformist in, in our culture? We want to be. Are we? No, we're, most of us are conformist. We'll fill out our forms. We'll sit in class. We'll take notes. We'll go to college. We'll do what our parents want us to do, even though we might not want to do any of it. Because secretly, we just want to get on a star cruiser, you know, and go somewhere else and just do my own thing. Right? So the nonconformist and the renegade is a strong part of romantic literature. So in Byron, we have Don Juan. We have Child Howard's Pilgrimage, where he leaves British society and travels in Arabia, travels through Spain, and has lots of adventures, mostly with really attractive women. All right, the Casanovas of the world. Okay, Napoleon is a romantic hero in many respects. All right. Uh, but there's lots of examples of this, especially in contemporary literature. We have, of course, this hunky guy. Right, what's his name? Jack Sparrow. All right, what's his real name? Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp, okay. He is the renegade hero. He is bad, but innately good. He's a pirate, but he's a good pirate. And he's sexy, right? We have Sirius Black, right? Serious Black. He, he's, a, he's an evil name. He's serious evil, right? Serious Black. But he's good, although society thinks he's evil. See, see the themes here? And we also have Easy Rider, the 1960s. Hippies traveling across the South on their motorbikes, right? Renegades, outsiders. But we love those stories about the outsider who are rebelling. Now, they pay a price for being hippies in the South. You have to see Easy Rider for that. Dennis Hopper 
and uh, Henry uh, Fonda, Henry Fonda's son. What was his name? Henry Fonda's son. Peter Fonda. Easy ride. All right, tenet number seven. Especially in romantic literature in America, it tends to be anti-materialistic. Ben Franklin was not a romantic. He was everything but a romantic. He was all about studying, logic, science, making money, making money, making a name for yourself, and enjoying the creature comforts. There's no way Ben Franklin would ever be happy sitting in this cabin all by himself that he made by himself with some friends. This is Walden's cabin. We're getting to Walden after Scarlet Letter. So there's this anti-materialistic, I don't need things to be happy. I don't need a Lexus. I don't need a smartphone. I don't need a camera. I don't need, I don't need designer clothing. I just need the basics, and I'm happy. The other stuff is just gets in the way. Right? So in American romanticism, there's this anti-materialistic strain uh, that you see, especially in Emerson, especially in Thoreau which you still see today in some aspects of American society. All right, the age of reason came before the age of romanticism. Truth can be derived from the mind, reliance from science, logic, reason, the Spock from Star Trek. If you know Star Trek, you have Captain Kirk, which is emotion, he's the romantic hero. Then we have Spock, he's the one that's science-based, logical. Right. If you know uh, Big Bang, is it what's what's that about? Sheldon. What's that? Sheldon. Sheldon. Right. What's that? The Big Bang Theory. Yeah. 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 Sheldon is the Star Trek logical. He's always. It makes a lot of sense. I'm trying to think of a romantic hero in that. Maybe Penny. I don't know. Uh, who would be more of the romantic? Right. And here's Rene Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. Here's, Star, here's, uh, here's uh, Spock, what is truth, who am I? Classical learning, structured, elegant, clear, delineation, traditional, formulaic. All right. How many here have a garden at their home? Garden, or parents like to garden. All right. If it's very formal, with it's like 90 degree, 90 degree angles, hedges here, everything is clearly delineated, that's a classically structured garden. Right now, there's different types of classically structured gardens. Here's an example. In the Age of Reason, we had Mozart, right? And this is. Let me give you a clip. It ticks us off, to be honest. It does make me feel a little bit frustrated. Nothing could be further from the truth. structured. Here, this is romanticism. This is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. He's a romantic. Now, in your mind, you're thinking, Mr. Van, that all sounds classical music to me. It just sounds... No, it sounds totally different. It's totally different. Totally very different. One is so... One is so highly polished, and one is like, da, da, it's like in your face. Da, 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 da. Here I am. It's very, it's very me. It's very I centered. All right. Let me show you. Uh, guys, before you pack up, we got a couple more minutes. Thank you. Where did my All right, here's Beethoven, and this is classical architecture, right? Based on ancient Rome and Greece, right? This is very familiar to you. We see buildings like this all around our country because the founding, the founders of the country used Greece and Rome 
as our paradigm, as our model. But notice what romantic architecture looks like. This is romantic architecture, very gothic. Okay? So this was in the style of romanticism. This is in the style of classic architecture, right? So we had it not just in literature, but we had it in music, we had it in art, we had it in philosophy. And then, of course, movements come and they go. Movements come and they go. Just like if you study art, you have Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, you have Cubism, you have Minimalism, you have all these types of different movements in art uh, that come and they go. It'll be interesting to see what movement we are in now. What are the painters? What are the composers? What are they doing now? And in literature, um, I don't know if I have a simple answer for that. All right. All right, guys, any questions on 